Hi, everybody. It's Mary Rowe uh, from the Canadian Urban Institute. Thanks for joining us for our second City Talk this week. Very, very pleased to have four fabulous contributors to talk to us uh, about what they've been seeing and experiencing across the country. As many of you know, uh, the Canadian Urban Institute is uh, headquartered in Toronto, but we now have regional leads across uh, the country. And we have many, many, many partners who've stepped up to support the work of creating connective tissue and creative collective problem solving for what challenges uh, municipalities and people that live in cities are going through, through COVID and how do we come through this and emerge and can you live with it in a creative and in a way that improves our cities and makes them better. Um, uh, the head office of CUI is located in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, um, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. And it's home now to many diverse First Nations uh, from the Inuit and Métis uh, communities as well across Turtle Island. Uh, Toronto was also covered by Treaty 13, which was signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties, which were signed with multiple Anishinaabek nations. And we have tried to conduct these city talks uh, for the last 15 or 16 weeks, um, trying to be as cognizant as we can of the, the histories of, and legacies of exclusion that contemporary urbanism over um, a century or two have continued to exclude people and not actually build the kind of connected tissue that CUI is championing across the country that we need to build in cities itself. Um, and uh, we're having to come to terms with that. We're having to reckon with that. And we appreciate people continuing to do their own personal struggles with this and what, um, how we're actually going to undo anti-black racism and different forms of exclusion. Um, and it's a, it's a journey and a learning journey. And we appreciate people being so frank and honest and candid about what has to change. Uh, I was on a call earlier this morning with a deputy minister in the federal government who was articulating that every fissure, every dysfunction, that every crack, I think was the language that she used, every crack in the system that existed before COVID has just been now greatly exacerbated. And where else do we see this more vividly than in the topic we're on today, which is how do we move? Um, so we appreciate these four coming on uh, to express uh, their own perspectives about what they've actually been seeing, what tangibly has been challenging, and then how do they, and how do we collectively imagine uh, what the transition is going to look like and what the future might look like and, and how we actually build cities. So joining us today um, are Stephanie Cadio, who is an MLA uh, for Surrey South, um, outside British Columbia. You may not know what an MLA is, but she sits in the provincial legislature. She is a policymaker and she's from the booming metropolis of Surrey, uh, which she just reminded me is the second largest municipality in British Columbia. Uh, Eddie Robar is here. He's a branch manager of, of Edmonton Transit Service, and he is actually coming to us live from the newest uh, transit uh, station um, uh, or a branch, whatever you're going to call it, Eddie. You'll tell us what it is. The, the, uh, not, it's not the office. It's not the yard. Whatever it is, you're at a transit. Garage. At a transit what are you calling it? Garage. Transit, transit garage, yeah. You're in a transit garage uh, in, in a mysterious location in suburban Edmonton. Uh, great to have you there. And Amina Yazin, who's a planning commissioner at the city of Toronto. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Horrible mistake to make from Central Camp. City of Vancouver, the Vancouver City Planning Commission. Uh, and uh, she's coming to us from New Westminster. And Armie de Francia, who's the active transportation coordinator at the town of Ajax, uh, founder of Transportation Equity Toronto, and coming in from booming central uh, GTA Pickering. Uh, we, we don't uh, go in great length on bios here on these things. People, the chat folks will post it for you. You can look up. What we always find happens is people frantically now start looking you up. And, uh, uh, and we always try to make clear to people that the City Talk, the conversation begins here. It never ends. It's ongoing. So continue that conversation at hashtag City Talk. Um, we'll post a video from this. Please contribute to the chat, put questions up, comments up, and we publish the chat. Just keep that in mind so people will see it for a long time. Um, and uh, we appreciate candor and uh, civility and respect, but also we want to get at the real challenges and the real issues. So uh, panelists, don't hold back. Tell us what you're really thinking. And let's start by going west. Uh, in fact, let's go to you, Stephanie, and unmute yourself, please. And let's just hear what's your perspective in terms of what you've been watching in terms of how we move, and then what do you think is ahead? Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me, and uh, hi, everyone that's joining us. Um, I'm coming here from the traditional Coast Salish territories uh, here in Surrey, right close to the border. Um, so actually, uh, this last little while has been uh, a real challenge for everyone, for sure. And certainly uh, for me, uh, I'm a person with a disability. Um, so I've taken extra precautions during this uh, process. Um, but certainly observing, um, and I would say uh, listening 
hearing from people all over the Lower Mainland and, and British Columbia about issues around transportation and how we move um, through this. And, and what does it mean, you know, going forward? What are the, what are, what are the things that are going to last? What are the things that are going, we're going to have to consider on an ongoing basis? Um, whether that means cross-border travel um, and, and those issues, or whether we're talking about um, changes that we're making in terms of transit ridership, in terms of cars and how we, and, and for people with disabilities specifically, obviously that's my um, sort of personal uh, area of interest. Um, and certainly there are, there are significant challenges with, with a lot of the changes that we're seeing uh, for people with disabilities. And there's, there's implications to how they are able to live their lives uh, in our communities. So just before we leave you, the, what, what actually happened to the transit system during COVID in, in Surrey? Can you tell us what measures they took? Um, well, within the lower main, I'll go lower mainland yeah, lower uh, mainland, sure. more um, and, and provincially. Um, transit ridership just completely dropped off, of course, um, which is hugely problematic for, for transit, uh, which meant uh, they, had to, they had to reduce some of their service. Um, certainly for our paratransit system, it was a challenge uh, because their inability to social distance uh, when people are interacting and, and assisting others as, and, and the challenge, of course, there being so many of the riders uh, had compromised immune systems to begin with. So there are some real concerns there. Um, and, uh, and, but, but we certainly saw our transit system do what they could uh, to adapt, um, to, to uh, drop fares, um, have people enter from from the rear entrance of the bus, uh, limited capacity and so on. Um, so I certainly think what we saw was uh, an attempt by everyone to, to adjust as quickly as possible. But I think uh, people are having to really rethink how we're going to do this uh, going forward if this is not a, this is, this is a, a long-term circumstance that we're living in. And you have a physical disability, so your actually so your entry and exit into the vehicles is, would be compromised. I don't know the extent to which paratransit services and special accommodation for people that have, that have mobility challenges to get onto cars. Have they been able to maintain that in the system out in your jurisdiction or no? Um, my understanding is that they have uh, provided individuals who are fairly independent. Um, and, and certainly the paratransit system did continue operating uh, at, with, for, for emergency type work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure uh, how effective that was, and frankly, I'm not sure how safe people felt. And right. I think that's the bigger question, was did individuals who have the disabilities and require modified transit options, did, did they feel confident and safe going out right. or not? And I don't, I don't think for the most part uh, people did. I think there was a great deal of anxiety, uh, and I think that persists today. Um, I see Gil Penalosa, one of our regular city talkers, is on uh, today in the chat. And Gil, it'd be great if you could put into the chat um, if you know of any data talking internationally about whether or not the virus is being spread, has, are there, is there evidence of community spread of the virus on transit systems around the world? Because my understanding is there's some studies suggesting out of Europe that it isn't being transmitted that way, which speaks to Stephanie's concern about how are we going to build public support back into feeling safe to take transit. Let's go to Amina now, if we could, and just talk to us, Amina, about your perspective um, as a transit advocate and all the kinds of challenges that, uh, uh, that we've been seeing around essential workers and the kinds of people that have actually continued to use transit and the risks, mm -hmm. et cetera. So thanks, Stephanie, we'll come back to you. Amina, can you fill us in on your perspective? Sure, so I'm also coming um, from the land of the Coast Salish peoples, the Muspian, um, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, I have no issues with you referring to me as a Torontonian, as I am a Torontonian as well. I'm very <laughs> much a multi-citizen in that way. Um, second, uh, during the course of this conversation and in light of the street protests, um, I hope to shed a light on the Black liberation movement that we've seen take to the streets and seriously engage um, with this long overdue conversation around racism and ableism that has led to the development of the deeply inequitable cities that we, Black, Indigenous, Disabled, Racialized, and other vulnerable groups of people are forced to navigate every single day of our lives before COVID. Um, and during COVID. Uh, this inequity exists within the built environment, transportation, health, food insecurity, and in the ways that public safety has been framed and who gets to move around cities 
uh, free of state level harassment while also considering who has been forced to move during COVID-19, yeah. um, including here in Vancouver and in Toronto uh, and across Canada. We are at the point today where this is an urgency to highlight the intersectional nature of street-based safety, underscoring the intersections between social issues, street infrastructure, design and policing. Uh, but before I dig deeper, I'd like to take a moment to sort of ask everybody participating to truly, truly consider how many of you have actually had a close call with police or felt unsafe while in public space, including on transit due to er over surveillance and over policing. Um, really, really think about that. Uh, I have to admit that I have um, in my role and as a citizen and lover of cities. And for those who experience this panic, while out in public space, this discomfort and feeling of over surveillance and lack of safety stems from a series of policies and regulations, including safer streets bylaws, COVID-19 physical distancing regulations, overcrowded and unreliable public transportation in the neighborhoods most affected by COVID-19, inequitable concepts such as open and slow street programs that are taking advantage of COVID-19 to perpetuate privilege for a valued segment of many cities' populations, um, ticketing and fare evasion, as we saw prior to COVID, um, and all of which are a direct result of racism, ableism, and state violence. And for those who aren't familiar with this, uh, with this struggle existing in public space, I invite all of us living in cities and in urbanism fields, especially those who espouse cities for all and open streets for people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds, to truly consider why Black people and disabled people are harassed and dying in public spaces while walking, while jogging, while riding their bicycles, while getting on a bus, um, and even while driving. Uh, moving forward, I very much, as I did in my article, ask uh, planners and elected officials and city lovers uh, to seriously contemplate what they can do to answer these calls for justice and redress and, and equity. Thanks, Amina. Um, it's interesting your your transit for you and transportation for you is a is a public space you're making that point right so obviously privatization of transit is a concern i'm assuming uh, mm -hmm. because it, it may be that in the constraints we're going to live in now we're going to see more private transit because the public transit systems are going broke um, and as you suggest the level of surveillance and lack of public safety is experienced by people of color disproportionately and it as it is in a park or a street or on a streetcar or in a subway, right? Absolutely, spatial anti-blackness is a real reality as I speak to in my Thai article. And also for, for disabled people, because the vast majority of those who, who, do, who are assaulted uh, in public spaces by police are also disproportionately disabled. Um, and yeah, the privatization of, of, a, of a public essential service is absolutely a threat, I think, um, to, to, to our democracy and to our systems. Uh, but what a, gr a greater threat is the fact that, um, you know, we continue to, to prioritize and not fund transit um, to begin with. And, and um, you know, I hope to get into that discussion further, but we, but we fund what we value, really, and then, and then we police that in which we can't fund. Right, right, and we're being asked questions like that at CUI about if we want to continue to make the case that the cities drive the economies of the country and that the dependency of a city on its public transit system is fundamental, therefore there needs to be investment in the transit. Um, Armi, let's talk to you. Uh, 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 you are actually, you are actually in the greater Toronto area, my, my mistake, Amina. Uh, uh, you're in, in Pickering. And uh, just talk to us about your particular perspective and what you've been, been observing. And I'm sure you're going to riff on what uh, the other two have said. And then we're coming home with you, Eddie. So let's go to you, Armi, first. You have to unmute yourself there and we're keen to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, so I'm a little nervous, but excited to be part of this discussion with people across the country. I am speaking from the land from land that is covered by the Williams Treaty, and also I represent a town that has one of the highest black populations in Canada. So the main challenge that I'm seeing overall is that there's a need for more access to affordable options for transportation. We're seeing limitations with transit, with driving. Driving can be quite expensive. Uh, transit with physical distancing limitations. And even with biking, as I, I don't know how it is across the country, but in the GTHA, there is a limited supply of bikes and bikes are being sold out. Uh, so it's very difficult for a lot of people to access a bike who previously didn't have so. At the same time, it's also important that as we think about 
post pandemic that we work towards a future where we focus on providing affordable options that are also safe for people to use without the fear of being harassed, without the fear of uh, facing um, negative tensions with enforcement or anything like that. So that's important moving forward. The town, I think that it's in terms of what's working, it's more important to hear what residents have to say about that. So instead of that, I'm going to focus more on what could be a, a potential opportunity. And our active transportation network is a pretty good foundation. We are receiving uh, concerns from residents about the need to improve it to make it more continuous, but at least it's showing that there is a concern and there is a desire for more for more transportation options beyond just transit and driving. So that's what we're seeing here so far. Oh, mm -hmm. and we also have um, we also have we also had the recent creation of well, council recently approved a motion to create an anti-black racism Congress. So we'll be exploring ways to to engage with black communities in order to do that. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in your comment about bikes. You know, we've had this conversation frequently on this, on City Talk about how the, the um, a certain privileged uh, constituency in urbanism have been trying to push for streets to be closed and more bike travel and that's perceived to accommodate a very slim portion of the urban population. So people that don't have access to bikes or people that have three kids and have to get them somewhere and they're not hauling them on a bike I have noticed that some of the biggest lineups now, at least in Toronto, are for bike shops, uh, like long lineups for people to get their bikes repaired and various things. And the one I was looking at is one of those uh, go in and fix your own bike places and I couldn't get over it. There was a long lineup for it. So these, these, this question of equitable distribution of mobility options, I guess, is the, is the big challenge. How do we, what's the relationship between mass transit and then these individualized more uh, uh, not standardized approaches to helping people move, I guess. Eddie, you're in the belly of the beast uh, uh, and you run, you run a system. So talk to us about the challenges that you're facing there. And I, I know that your system, uh, you, maybe you should tell people, what is the current level of functioning of the Edmonton system and what are you looking at going forward with all the uh, expenses that you've had to incur with yeah, the sure. fare box diminishing? Yeah, yeah we're, uh, we're sitting on Treaty 6 land here in Edmonton and uh, I'm coming to to you from the Kathleen Andrews Transit Facility, which is our newest transit garage named after our first uh, woman transit driver. So uh, pretty excited about that. Uh, certainly a lot going on in Edmonton and work. All the conversation here is fantastic because certainly it's where transit companies and transit properties need to start uh, focusing effort on that, that equitable um, approach and ensuring that we have a, a program that really supports uh, mobility in the cities that we're in. And uh, we have a large indigenous population as well here, and certainly um, being attentive to that and understanding the impacts um, that is for a transit system. Uh, looking at what happened and what's been happening in, in Edmonton, uh, very similar to most transit systems across the country, a huge decrease in ridership for us. We went down to about 25% of what we normally had um, for ridership, and now we're kind of scooting back up to that 50% range right now, um, but certainly presents a lot of challenges. Being a transit person myself, you know, our goal was trying to get as many people on transit as you can. And and this first time in my career where I, I had to focus on on limiting the amount of people on a vehicle and um, you know trying to ensure that we had enough service out there to keep um, distance possible on our on our, our service itself. We're running at about 50% of our service level right now. Uh, still on our Saturday enhanced schedule, so a little beefed up Saturday schedule for us. Um, that seems to be holding for what we have for ridership uh, right now, but we're looking to uh, resumption of service in August, the end of August. So back up to, to normal services. And certainly that focus on, on some of the conversation around here, around you know what fare evasion looks like and how we handle that. And uh, our fare policies is something that we're discussing from that GBA plus lens and really trying to ensure that we're not um, uh, further pushing people into uh, areas that they don't need to be. And I think that, um, you know, the, some of the work that we've been doing before COVID was really focused on, on trying to get an affordable system, an affordable program in place. We've done things like our ride transit program, which I, I still contend is probably the single best thing we've ever implemented in, uh, in my transit career. And I've been doing this for about 18 years now. 
uh, but certainly um, giving people access to mobility in the city. This program uh, provides passes to people at a, at a deeply discounted rate um, at, and it's over 22,000 people a month using it. And uh, it, it really has impact on people having to choose between groceries or, um, you know, going to work versus uh, their rent. And I think that, um, you know, those programs and the, the focus of Edmonton Transit, not only is it about providing the right service out there, but it really is about giving people access to mobility in the city and how we grow that uh, in the future. So uh, some of our plans got a, a, a little bit paused um, with, the, with the outbreak and certainly that um, has presented lots of challenges for us, but um, it certainly hasn't stopped our progression in trying to maintain that, that progress that we've already had. And certainly um, some of the benefits that come from COVID-19 is it highlighted a lot of the social inequities and, and challenges that are in our community and really put it in the forefront for people when you have no place to go um, and, and you see it. And I think that that, you know, when, when all the stores are closed and, you know, you see that, that social inequity like in front of your face, it really makes you pay attention and it really looks at um, an ability for us to take that run with it and look at um, how we can improve that that world for us and social housing and how important that becomes in the future. Thanks. Um, you know, it's interesting, these conversations that we're having uh, about urbanism and it, we had prior to COVID articulated for CUI that urbanism is for everyone. And the, the dilemma is that you can, you can aspire to that, but it doesn't necessarily happen. You know, it doesn't happen unless everyone is engaged in actually creating uh, urban environments. And um, one of the things we've watched across the world is that during COVID, because our homelessness services were inadequate, that lots of homeless folks were getting onto subways and streetcars and spending the whole day there because it was a safe place and there was no other place. So they're sort of cascading effects, eh? And how are we going to sort of prioritize this? The, the, I'm interested in terms of you folks and your perspective. Um, if, we're, if we're not going to, if we're going to be spending more time at home, if we're not going to be going into the core as much for the next foreseeable future, do you think that should affect how we allocate resources for transit systems? Let me just, why don't I start asking Army that? I mean, do you have a sense of how you would prioritize how you would spend money? Um, what, what part of the system would you rebuild first? Have you thought about that yet? I'm not sure what part of the system that we would rebuild first per se. Although I think it's still important to consider ways in which we can expand these affordable options for mobility, whether or not people are staying at home. After all, for many, staying at home is a privilege right. that a lot of people don't have. So there's still people like essential workers who do need to get around, and there's still people who need to go to hospitals or mm -hmm. to doctor's appointments or grocery shopping, all those different types of essential trips. I think the next direction that would help is working on policy. So currently, at least in the Ontario context, we have policies and guidelines for walkability, AODA, so accessibility to a certain extent, transit, driving, and, 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 and bikes as well. But there's other modes of transportation that are emerging or that have been used in other countries for a while that we just don't have the guidelines for or that are emerging or not that clear yet. So for example, e-bikes are, there's been a study in the UK in 2019 that found that e-bikes had uh, positive mental health benefits for seniors. Um, and, and currently in Ontario, there's a lot of municipalities who don't really have regulations on uh, e-bikes as yet, or they're still creating them. And then there's e-scooters, of course, and then there's also cargo cycles. So cargo cycles, they are, they could be pedal powered or they could be powered by electric motors. But there's currently, the regulation, at least in Ontario, is that bikes only have two, maybe three wheels. So they don't really accommodate for cargo cycles, which could have many right. wheels. And there are low carbon mobility options that could carry people, that could carry goods at a much lower cost. So just opening, we, we need political will in order to cr create guidelines and policies that support these other 
uh, affordable transportation options that could benefit a wide variety of groups, whether it be people with disabilities or gender nonconforming folks or seniors or other people who have been historically neglected systemically. You know, the dilemma, though, I can feel it just lurking there is that if we somehow take our eyes off focusing on invest back in the major system, don't let our don't let our t our don't let our subway system collapse that we may miss the opportunity that you're just implying, which is maybe we need a whole mix of different things. You know, what, what do you think, Amina? And then I'm going to come to Stephanie. Um, have you thought about that? About Do you like uh, the idea of a mix of, system, a mix of things, or would you rather just get the main spine of the system back, back up and running? What's your instinct on I, that? I, I agree immensely uh, with Army. I do think that we need to look at, at uh, you know, multiple forms. We need to look at mo mobility and then look at modality and multiple, multiple forms of that and how those feed into each other. But I think, again, going to the original question, um, in my article, I ask us to basically recognize our role in perpetuating environmental inequities and spatial anti-Blackness. And in it, I state that governments and cities fund what they value and as a result, who they value and then police um, what they refuse to fund, right? And so just as Army mentioned today, like during these converging crises, uh, including COVID, we find ourselves in, once again, the poor who are disproportionately racialized and disabled, and, and disabled have absolutely been um, conscripted by economic force and racism to perform the patriotic duty to risk death for middle and upper class consumers. Those are our essential services. Those are the, the people using our transit systems mostly. Those are not the people that were able to pivot very quickly um, and piggyback off the work of uh, disabled, uh, uh, disabled justice uh, uh, advocates who essentially were advocating uh, for a style of working from home to accommodate their needs, um, but we pivoted very quickly for a very privileged group of people. And so again, the racialized and the most marginalized are the ones on public transit. Um, and so we really need to look at that because it, it, their services are declared essential, but then the services that they require um, to perform their work, which is public transit, is essentially non-essential. And it remains non-essential because the federal government has essentially preferred to bail out millionaires by granting companies like Loblaws $12 million um, and other means, um, which translated to Loblaws purchasing more energy efficient fridges when the government could have easily um, have used those funds along with other bailout programs issued to the most privileged to support the transportation systems across Canada that have less ridership, but with a constant ridership, which are those racialized groups, which are those marginalized groups, which tur turn out to be those essential service workers that we step out every single day and clap for at seven o'clock, um, but don't really interrogate what this means, who are grocery store workers. Um, and that leads into a bigger conversation about where our, our food comes from and what's happening with migrant workers currently. Um, and so this feeds into so many different intersections and food insecurity and all sorts of measures um, who again, can't work from home and have been conscripted essentially to do this work and rely on transit during a public health cri crisis that also requires physical distancing. So, and there are many organizations across the country, including here in Metro Vancouver, who have been doing this work, who have been advocating day in and day out uh, for affordable and accessible transit, such as the All On Board Project through the BC Poverty Reduction Group, group uh, here, who even before COVID advocated for a sliding scale monthly pass system based on income, free transit for youth, and a reprioritization of need when it comes to transit users. And sometimes it's equity work that people are just, you know, you know, what I call white urbanists and status quo urbanists who can't sit in complexity. They just do not know how to sit in complexity. Um, and so they have really a very difficult time understanding that our streets and our transit system are not neutral. Um, and that's why we need to completely and constantly reiterate uh, these realities and that a lot of the ways that we've been able to pivot have been because of grassroots organizations, um, primarily who are actually uh, oppressed groups of people who are not bicyclists, because bicyclists are also not an oppressed group of people. So while I, while I bicycle and I see the importance of it, I am not, I am not going to prioritize um, a discussion on that over a human rights issue uh, that we are, we are seeing. Amina, would you, would you advocate for transit to be made free? Um, I would. I think it comes down to exactly my point of, you know, re reprioritization. And I think once we start reprioritizing and re really looking at that and developing, um, you know, equity frame frameworks and tools um, as a foundation uh, for our transit system, then we can do it because we've seen 
we've seen where the federal government has been able to step in. Like COVID right. has shown us, COVID has shown us who, who is valued, right? Again, yeah. who, are, who are we bailing out? We've bailed out the airlines. That's a form of transportation. So why were we unable to do the same? Right. Uh, I mean, transportation system? Right. I mean, we've also, you know, the federal government also managed to get money in the hands of millions of Canadians very quickly through CERB. So I hear you that the, it, all these decisions reflect a set of values. And do we have an opportunity to pivot now and actually insist that the investments of the federal and the provincial and the municipal governments align around equity and around keeping, actually allowing the city to move and generate the wealth that actually pays the taxes for us to actually invest in these things. Stephanie, what are you thinking in terms of all what your colleagues are saying here? Um, what do you see that the perspective, I mean, you're a provincial legislator and uh, I know that in British Columbia, uh, the provincial government does invest in transit, uh, but there's also still a dependency on the fare box. And do you have a sense, uh, I mean, I know you've sat at those provincial federal tables as head banging as they are uh, to try to figure out what the share should be. But what do you think? Do you think going forward, we should be investing in getting more federal and provincial dollars into local transit systems? I think we have to do a fundamental rethink of how we plan things. And, and from that perspective, what I mean by that is I think we have to flip how we, you know, flip and start over how we, um, how we look at designing how we move. So we have to start with the pedestrian network. And then we have to look at the multimodal bikes and e-bikes and, and what have you, and how does that fit in? And then we have to look at um, the, the, the car and, and motor network, which is essential, the car bus motor network. And, and I, I include those because that includes roads. Um, and, and although, you know, it's not just the things that go on the roads, the transit, uh, it's not just the, um, the, the sky train as we have here or other, other, you know, mass transit options. It's all of the options, but I think we have to start looking at how we, how we look at it. Why, why are we doing it and for who? Um, because we're not doing it for everybody. Right. Um, and, and in my, from my perspective, from a disability perspective, Disability is always an afterthought on all of these things. And, and I know that's similar for, for equity-seeking groups, uh, minorities, and, and marginalized people. Um, and, and COVID has elevated those issues. It has brought them to the forefront. Um, because yes, the transit, certainly transit in British Columbia is, is subsidized or by uh, the provincial government to some degree. Uh, but 33% of the revenues uh, for the metro transit is fare box, and 17% for rural transit is fare box. Uh, so it's still a significant amount of, yeah. of what they need to operate. The provincial government tends to look more at the at at investing in the capital infrastructure pieces, um, the big you know multi-billion dollar investments. Um, and participating there, as with the federal government, and and that's the division of powers that we see in Canada, and and that's a that's a complex issue in and of itself. Um, but if we look at who are we designing for and why, and and are we including everybody from the beginning? Um, if we don't build sidewalks properly, then people can't get to the to to the bus. If we don't build um, bike lanes properly, then people with disabilities can't cross the street safely. Right. Um, because certainly the bike lanes, although I'm in favor uh, of having a, uh, the opportunity for people to, to use uh, bikes and, and e-bikes and all these sorts of things, can be an incredible barrier for people with disabilities. So if we, if we start looking strategically at all of the users and the users most impacted, um, before we look at, okay, and now what about cars and what about roads and, and what do we need? Because it's, you know, it's all necessary. It's all essential for the economy, right? It's, we have to have a massive highway and road structure and we have to invest in it because we have to move people between cities. Mm -hmm. We have to move goods. We have to move ambulances um, and all those sorts of things. But we also need really good mass transit options for people, not for for people who require it because they can't afford an alternative and for people because they want to make that choice and and use those options we want people to do that and so how how are we going to ensure that there's enough ridership and enough and enough uh 
money invested? And how do we make sure that when we do that, that we're not excluding the groups that need probably need to use it the most? Um, and that includes people with disabilities uh, who often are left out in the in the in the cold in this. And afterwards, we try to ad ad adjust and adapt. And adjusting and adapting is far more expensive and less effective. Um, and it and it leaves people you know marginalized, which isn't isn't the plan. So I think we have a a massive task ahead of us as a society, and it can't be directed at any one level of government or any one group as as uh, you know, being the the error maker here. This is how this has evolved over centuries, and we need to we need to reevaluate how we do things. We need to take a broader look at it, and and we can't we can't. Um, I don't think if you know point and say they should do that or they should do that because ultimately there's there's one taxpayer, and that's every individual. Uh, mm -hmm. Ultimately pays into the system and has an op should have an opportunity to participate in that uh, in that design and that uh, and ultimately in the use of that system for their benefit. COVID showed us we need the essential workers to get to work. If, if they can't get to work on transit, we don't have people running grocery stores. We looked at, you know, it, it's a bigger question about equity in terms of what do we what do we think is essential? Again, I'm able to work from home. I'm in a job that allows that. Well, great, but you know, the essential worker at the grocery store working at minimum wage can't do that. And they're they're making minimum wage. Why? So, but we're we're not talking about how we manage uh, the cost of food if we want to pay those workers more. So these are such complex issues for governments and and for society generally. Um, but I think too often we get we get focused on very partisan, very very pointed um, political debates about what's a priority and what's not. And we should be having a conversation more wholly, more holistically about why why we need to do these things as a society. Well, I can I can feel people cheering to hear a provincial politician talk as as boldly as you just did there, uh, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, and uh, you're just echoing Amina's point that this is about complexity. And on the chat function, um, we've had an interesting discourse going on here about whether people are willing to appreciate that this is a complex, interrelated conversation and that we can't just talk about transportation in a siloed way. It has to be all of these things, uh, it's all linked together and how do we start again. And, and our, uh, my bias would be that we start with local places and build out what do, what do places need and see if we can start to talk about equitable places and all the things that go into that. Uh, that's just my personal bias. But um, Eddie, I'm interested from your perspective, you're hearing your colleagues here making a whole lot of comments that are I think not only about a transit system, they're actually about, I guess, this notion of mobility as a service, right? That it's more than just, but you're the core of the system, right? Like if your yeah. system is broken, no amount of ad hocery is probably gonna get us where we need to go, right? Yeah, I think I, I love what I'm hearing and Amina made some great points. I think that sliding scale information, you know, we have a sliding scale here in Edmonton, which um, is, is great and it's had huge impact on mobility in the city, uh, certainly to the point where we provide free transit for those under the low income cutoff and uh, for seniors. So how does you know, that work, Eddie, mechanically, yeah. how does that work? So you, you get on the system and how does it know where you fit in the scale? So you don't know the difference between somebody who has a low income pass or a okay. regular rider. So there's ways to get the pass um, for all of our, our, um, uh, our, our people that are on the program. But when you ride the bus, nobody would know the difference between somebody that would be on low income or not. So we try there's to no do that. Stigma. There's no stigma transference there? No, no stigma transference. So we try to avoid that as much as possible with, with the program. But certainly when we talk about essential services, and, and Amina pointed it out, you know, there is there is privilege. And at the end of the day, when you look at the system that we've created in transit, um, we had to reduce our service by half. Uh, and we have people that are essential workers and people that need to go to work and you know that flexibility uh, is diminished on on the service itself so you know we rely on that funding to be able to provide the service and certainly having that subsidy and looking to better subsidized transit systems allows us to provide a better service and I think that that um, that social inequity is very prevalent in today's 
uh, world that we're in. And it certainly speaks volumes to what we need to work on from a policy perspective uh, for the transit industry. If we're thinking that our ridership and our mobility through the city will be the same from here on out, we're kidding ourselves. I think that there's uh, a lot of change in, in the way that people are gonna move to the city. Uh, how we deliver the services have changed. Uh, certainly even in the reductions of service that we have, how we redeploy our services in different ways has been uh, something we've been dealing with as well. You know, we have uh, reduced our service, but that is service impacts, you know, our hospital workers and people that need to get to, to jobs. And we've kind of repurposed our paratransit service to provide an on-demand service for essential service workers so that they can um, use our on-demand service that was, um, we kept at the level that we would normally have, even though we were 80% reduced in our service to provide uh, an on-demand service for essential service workers. So um, there's a lot of differences in the way that we're going to approach the next six months, year, two years. And a lot of that is around ensuring that we have the affordability of our transit system, looking at the ways to subsidize uh, the service so that we're providing the best service for people and the best mobility through the city. And I think that that mobility is changing. So we have to watch and monitor and the predictability of that, um, that ridership. You know, we're probably gonna be at about 60% by the end of the year of our ridership. And it'll probably take us a few years to recover um, to the point that we were six months ago. But um, the only, and the difference of, of us reinstituting services from a transit perspective can't be just a focus on, you know, just getting back to where we were. You know, the changes in the, the environment and the world and are going to force everyone to take that sober second look at the way we provide our service, the way we move for the city, and how do we make sure that we're attentive to um, new mobility, new changes, the way that people move through the city, and that we're providing that service in different ways. So we're looking at things like on-demand transit, lower ridership neighborhoods, how can we get affordable uh, service options into communities to provide mobility for people. Uh, certainly on the senior side of it and the, the, the work we're doing on the, um, on the affordability for seniors is about giving them the ability to age in place, you know, and, and giving that mobility through the, through the city as well. So there's, there's a lot of change in the way that we do our business, um, just in how we provide the service, but certainly in the social realm and ensuring that we have an affordable transit system for all um, and not just the privileged is going to be, this highlights it through and through and making sure that we have access to that. Eddie, I'm going to have to ask you to speak up a little bit. I'm, I'm, I know it's because you're on a panel with all women that you're uh, talking a little more softly, but you might just have to bellow a little bit. Give us your big bellow out of that transit garage because I'm having a little trouble hearing you. But um, can I just ask you a question about what about this fear? You're a transit operator. You're dependent on the decisions of your council and how they spend their money. Do you anticipate a bit of a bun fight coming in terms of you having you and your bosses having to really advocate hard that they need to prioritize putting money into an equitable transit system? And you're going to be up against housing advocates and people saying taxes have to go down and blah, blah, blah. how are you anticipating making that case as a person in a system? Well, I think um, we're very fortunate in Edmonton. I think that we have a very supportive um, citizen services area. Our mayor is a huge advocate for social equity. And I think that our policies and directives have been very focused on taking that full holistic GBA plus lens on ensuring that everything that we're taking is going to have that modified approach. So I, I'm less concerned about that here. I think it's a whole system perspective. It's not just about transit, it's about that urban environment. I think that um, we have to look at it holistically. Certainly this is a, a realm and, and I never thought I would get into that social realm as deeply as I have in the last, the last few months. And I think that um, we're trying to help as best we can to make sure that our social services area has the full support of, of transit behind it. And our city is very focused on having that holistic effort. We've had, uh, through this COVID crisis, we've had about 26 people around a table meeting every single day about how do we handle these social issues and how do we support and not penalize people for, you know, in an, a system that really was broken. And it shows and highlights that uh, every day that we kind of go through this crisis for sure. And mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's in, in, in ways, it's a good thing because it helps us focus better on on taking that effort and, and focusing it in areas where we really can truly have 
uh, impact as a full system. Yeah, I mean, it's all so inextric inextricably linked, as you say. And I love you suggesting that you never thought you'd be into the social business, but now you're in it. So yeah. I think welcome, welcome to contemporary urbanism and that we've all got to be thinking about all of it all the time. And not everybody can, can do it, but this is the challenge. Army, when you look at your, your advocacy and where you're focusing, the, where your constituency wants you to go, um, can you see a kind of merging of housing advocacy, transportation advocacy, transit advocacy, do you think it's going to back to being place oriented? The success of places needs all of this. What are you thinking? So my city building work with Transportation Equity Toronto is more about raising awareness on transportation equity through an intersectional lens. And right. absolutely, there's ways of, well, we have to look at it holistically. We have to consider food security as well as affordable housing. So affordable housing affects who gets uh, it, it's it's a, a strong indicator currently of who gets access to these affordable options, who gets access to these walkable areas, who gets access to these uh, areas that are more likely to meet AODA, sorry, accessibility standards. Right. So it, it is necessary to look at it holistically. And to be honest, transportation does deal with it. It does deal with the, it makes a huge impact on a lot of those issues anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess one of the fears people have is uh, this is maybe an existential fear though is that somehow people will stop using transit they'll stop they'll we'll stop building compact communities we'll all just get back into living in suburbs and we will oh okay amina you're shaking your head you don't think that's going to happen i don't think it's going to happen because we're not seeing it happening again those who are most vulnerable are still using transit and if we just again reprioritize our lens and look at who's always um you know relied on transit and also who's who's now again um forced uh to be mobile at this time and 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 heavily rely on transit that then we can really start having a truly complex conversation about maintaining um our transportation system uh through through you know multimodal considerations but especially through public transportation for the most needy but when you say they're forced to be mobile, meaning that their jobs are a distance away from them and they only have transit as the option to get there? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, so that among other things, yeah. So do you see the solution? I mean, again, I don't, there's no simple solution, but do you think that we should have jobs closer to our homes? I guess that's a question. So do we want to move more to uh, supporting economic development in neighborhoods so that you don't have to schlep so far to your job? That's one thing. Or do we want to continue to have employment be distributed across a, a metropolitan area? And so you can choose, well, to the extent you can, you choose to live in a certain area and your job may in fact be in a different part of the area, as long as there's a transit option. It's a false choice again, because we need okay. affordable housing and we need all these other elements that, that, that function intersection, you know, intersectionally. So that conversation tends to happen again with a very privileged segment of our society. We know that cities, you know, we know that what was once considered the inner city does not look like the inner city. We, we understand that that subsect of people have been pushed out to the fringes. Just look at the city of Toronto, which is one of the most segregated economically and right. racially and uh, where I grew up very much. And so the city of Toronto does not look like what I uh, understood it and grew up as and so you know certain specific groups of people have been moved uh, have been forced out um, to become suburbanites I never considered myself a right. suburbanite where I grew up but I you know we were we, we grew up on the fringes and heavily relied on public transportation yeah. and so it's very important and so I'm going to pivot to Toronto because I am a Torontonian as well despite wherever I live in the world uh, and so overcrowded and unreliable public transportation and low-income and racialized neighborhoods again is exactly what I'm stating here we're an issue before COVID-19 but are actually further exacerbated as we know. Like, let's just look, for example, at the Jane Corridor, which has been one of the most neglected for years for, for, for decent, reliable, and equitable transit. I took the Jane Corridor when I grew up, right? Um, and has also seen mainly low black, low income, black, racialized, and disabled riders continue to suffer immensely during COVID-19. One of the ways we're starting to see that change uh, is through a project led by champions, right? Like, I really do not agree with this whole championing. We really need this to, to be cemented as just the norm, but by a champion named Matthew Davis from the Transportation Services Branch at the City of Toronto, who through relationship building, listening, and reframing of transportation as an equity issue foundationally is working on instituting a transportation and equity framework tool and a reprioritization of projects led by equity at its foundations to push for dedicated bus lanes 
in the most underserviced neighborhoods, including the Jane and Finch area, which continues to see high rates of COVID-19 and overcrowding and unreliable transportation. That, that specific corridor, like since I've grown up, you would see people spilling off the side of sidewalks as they waited for unreliable transportation. So it's part of the equity framework tool development and based on the Jane and Finch community's passionate pleas for, for exclusive bus lanes yesterday, just yesterday during the Toronto Transit Commission board meeting, um, equity as a priority can begin to be standardized. Uh, one way to do this is through state of good repair programs or transportation projects such as the rapid bus, uh, um, bus lane in Jane and other planning projects can actually piggyback off of state of good repair public works programs that go beyond road maintenance, resurfacing and paving and actually move determinedly towards using equity as a lens for where these projects are prioritized as we know that streets and street work is not neutral. So it's about it's it's really not rocket science. It's about right. prioritization. You know, right. I want to jump in, in as well, budget. Mary, because <laughs> I think what Amin is saying is is very very true. It was a sort of a false question in the sense that, um, yeah, I think everybody sort of gets the concept of living and working close together and walking and all that if you can. And and the idea of building cities that way is is great. It's 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 it would be ideal, right? But we don't live in ideal and it, and even if we want to live in ideal it is likely only to happen for some people um so right now for example i have a housing bill uh that i'll be re reintroducing next week about about codifying into law the fact that you have to build housing that works for everyone and by that uh i'm not talking about housing from an affordability perspective which is a whole other question but if we aren't even making it the law that you have to build housing that works for people who are disabled or aging, then how is it that a person with a disability can live close to work? They don't have a choice. They don't, they don't have an option as to where to live. They have one place to live. It's where they currently live and it's unlikely they're going to be able to find somewhere to move to because we aren't building that housing. There's 10,000 new units of housing in my area uh, my, my, my own little riding constituency of Surrey that's being developed. Not one of those townhomes is visitable, never mind adaptable or, or livable. So how do people with disabilities visit friends? How do they, how do they live close to work? So those are things that's that where we talk about that complexity, the whole thing has to work together. And we have to be realistic about the fact that even when we build um, the we, we attempt to build the ideal. Unless we are planning for everyone from the beginning, we will leave people out and there will be a need for other things. So I think that's the, for me, that's the big question is again, why are we leaving these things out? We are, we are focusing entirely on, well, it works for, for that person with a university education and a hundred thousand dollar a year salary, but does it work for every person? Does it work for somebody who's retired? Does it work for somebody who, who uh, is a minimum wage worker at the grocery store? Because we need those people in our communities too, right? We need all of these people to make our society work. And, and there's so many pieces that the market has to balance and places where legislators have to step in because the market can't. And, and these are, I think, some of the issues we're talking about today, about where does that transit need to be? And how affordable does that transit need? What does affordability in transit mean and for, for whom? Um, why is that important? Why is it important that we have bike networks, networks but who do they serve? Um, because it's not universal. Right. Um, lots of activity in the chat here. Always great to see so much animated conversation in the chat. Um, this one's been particularly spirited and I appreciate everyone taking the time to do that. Lots of interest in resources. So if people have, before we, we only got six more minutes. So people on the chat, if you've got links for resources, everyone wants to see Matthew Davis's equity tool and he's saying, <laughs> I'm working on it. Thanks for the shout out. I mean, he's now frantically typing to try to keep the chat people happy. Uh, if anybody has other tools that they're aware of, equity tools, I see Tamika Butler's on from the US. Uh, could you post them in the chat, please, so that we'll then get them up online for people to watch, to read later. Um, these conversations are always so fabulous because they just unearth a whole bunch of new questions and a whole bunch of new things. You know, we're not going to rebuild our cities overnight, thankfully, because sometimes when you do it too quickly, you do it wrong, and uh, it's going to be a whole process. So as we go into the next 
you've got five more minutes here, so I'm going to ask each of you for a minute. As we go into the next 100 days, you know, we published a report called COVID-100 at the 100 days, and it talks about huge challenges in mobility. And we've now, we're kind of going to come up to the next 100 days. For each of you, what would your priority be, do you think? What are you going to advocate for? What do you think is doable in the next 100 days as we end the summer and go into the fall? Let me start with you, Eddie. What's your priority that you're going to really be heads down focusing on? Well, certainly we're... Um immediately focused on getting our service back um, and hiring back operators that we had to lay off. I mean, we've had a pretty big impact. We've had to lay off about 500 of our operators um, in our, our service now. So getting that back to a place where we can uh, give the service that people deserve back is one of those uh, elements for us. Certainly as we start moving beyond that, um, part of our plans prior to this was really about um, reevaluating our transit system and, and redeploying our, our resources in a way that makes more sense um, and, and going with a better integrated network uh, than before. And certainly that means everything from integrating demand services, which is on the, the radar for us for the probably the largest deployment of demand-based services coming to Edmonton uh, in North America. So um, certainly getting into communities and with an affordable option for people that is truly integrated into the transit system. But even beyond that, um, the city of Edmonton is really about getting connected regionally with our transit system. So we have about eight, nine different transit systems around the city of Edmonton. And uh, that region is conforming to a regional transit commission and looking to provide one transit system, one fare system, one affordability system, and really look at integrating that across the region and the Edmonton region itself so that we get seamless travel no matter what boundary or border you cross municipality you're in and ensuring that we have that seamless travel for people um, whether and and really have a tailor-made solution for people what kind of community they're in and that they all have access to uh, affordable transit service okay uh, and just a minute over just a minute I, I got to get each of you to hold it to a minute uh, Stephanie a minute from you then army and then Amina go Steph sure um, well I think uh, just noticing the chat and some conversation uh, for me, one of the things that, that I've been really concerned about provincially here, um, and I'm focusing provincially because, of course, that's where my, my head is at on a daily basis, but we are seeing a, an actual reduction in requirements, right? So, for example, the, 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 the need for there to be accessible parking places um, has been removed from our code and left up to municipalities, which means now 182 municipalities have to, have to create a new set of regulations for themselves and figure out how to do this right. We, the reality is, like I say, with all of these things, nothing is, not, there's no magic bullet. There's no one thing we need and one thing we don't. What we have to start doing is looking from the beginning at are we including everybody in our planning? And including everybody in our planning means that yes, there's gonna be a need to have accessible parking places because not everybody is going to use transit or a ride a bike. Um, these are these are things we have to consider, and we have to get that we have to get that thinking in at the beginning, not as an afterthought or well, it's a nice to have. It's not. It's absolutely essential from the beginning. And my focus is on trying to trying to get provincial uh, bureaucrats and and politicians to understand that that planning mm -hmm. has to be cemented in that that desire to serve everyone has to be cemented in at the beginning. And we have a moment. We have a moment as we reset. Okay, uh, absolutely agreeing with people that are suggesting there's no magic bullet here. And these, these panelists would never have suggested they had the magic bullet, I know. Okay, you. let's hear from you, Army, and then Amina to end. A minute from you, Army. Okay, so at the town of Ajax, we're currently working on promoting existing active transportation routes to let people know their options and to let people know that these are practical ways for getting them to move around town. And we're also, we'll also be investigating ways in which we can better engage residents, particularly black residents. So there's also opportunities to speak with the Ontario Traffic Council on how we can improve equity and how we can improve our overall transportation system. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Amina. Quickly, One. this conversation for me is about mobility, not modality, even though we do need to look at that. I'm going to point to quite a few people. Uh, read Safe Streets Are Not Safe for Black Lives, Dr. Destiny Thomas. Uh, engage with Tamika Butler's work, who's who's been discussing um, Vision Zero and policing for years now. 
uh, Review a Tale of Two Truths, Transportation and Nuance in the Time of COVID-19 by Ariel, Road, uh, Ariel Ward, who discusses complicity. Uh, please take into consideration and dig into Jay Pitter's call uh, for courage. I have my article out, Who Streets, Black Streets. Um, please engage in the work of Stephanie Allen, Hogan's Alley Society co-founder and board member. Uh, her thesis, Fight the Power, Redressing Displacement and Building a Just City for Black Lives in Vancouver, which redresses the urban renewal project of eliminating um, the only Black community in the city of Vancouver through a failed highway project. Um, this year in June, we occupied and opened the Georgia viaducts um, and maintained them for bicyclists and people on foot. Uh, but immediately that group of people who were predominantly Black organizing were criminalized. And so when some are criminalized, for, for, for opening streets while others are patted on the back and rewarded, that's a real conversation that we need to have, this patio conversation that we need to have about who it's affecting and who gets to move freely. So um, yeah, mobility is, is the focus for me here and I think should be the focus for many. Thank you. Uh, well, the conversation continues, as I say. So I just want to thank all four, all four of you for putting your heart and soul into this. And um, there were a lot of a lot of references to materials that were just made. I mean, it just listed off some. We'll um, see if we can collect them and put them up on the chat. And if any of our panelists have other suggestions, just give send them to us, and we'll post them up. And as everyone knows, the chat gets posted online as well. So don't worry, you won't uh, lose this uh, these links. Um, I just want to comment that. Uh, Phoenix Wong's daughter, I think it's a daughter uh, at 10 months old, just entered into the chat. I think it's the first time we've had a 10 month old enter into the chat. <laughs> Urbanism is for everyone, just saying. Uh, next week we come back with City Talk and we're gonna focus on another theme from our COVID-100 report, which is um, how we care. And we're gonna have a panel just of young people and then we're gonna talk about older people. So uh, where we know that there's been a disproportionate uh, incidence of COVID-19 in long-term care facilities across the country and apparently across the world. So obviously not quite, uh, not quite there yet in terms of how we actually uh, do aging in place. One of you mentioned that I think before, and we've got a ton, tons of challenges ahead of us. So the conversation is only continuing. City building is never over. Thank you very, very much for joining us as we try to reimagine and re, re commit ourselves to building cities that are for everyone and can and involve everyone. So thanks, Stephanie, Army, Eddie, and Amina. Really, really a pleasure to have you. And uh, thanks for joining us. And have a good weekend, everyone. If you can get a weekend, I hope you get one. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Thank everyone. You, everyone. Thank you. Everyone.